Well, good morning again. We're going to be in Exodus 33 this morning. And um, I just need to know one thing before we get into our text. And that is the typical way that we preach on a Sunday morning is through exposition. That is, we read a text and we expose what is there, exposition. Um, what, the r- what the writer's point was for his readers is what the sermon's point is for you. It's a one-to-one connection there. I'm convinced that's the right way to preach. I'm convinced that's the typical way to preach. But not the only way to preach. That's the bottom of the food pyramid. That's where our diet needs to be. But there's other places and other times um, where you can do other things. Um, so... Whereas with expository preaching, what we normally do, let's say you go up to the author of the text, Moses, for us, we're in Exodus 33, and say, hey, you listened to that sermon. What was the point of Exodus 33 and 34? And he'd say, I mean, I hope he'd say, if we're doing our job right, he'd say exactly what you said, that you, you nailed it. That's what I'm trying to communicate in this text. Um, this morning, I'm not necessarily intending to do exposition. I'm going to be working through a passage with you, but I want to focus on a couple of the details in the text and not necessarily the main point of the text. Um, so if you ask Moses after this sermon, hey, w- Exodus 33 and 4, what are those about? Moses is going to say, this is about God's covenant presence with his covenant people in light of his covenant principles, which is an excellent sermon outline. Um, But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm going to focus on some different details in the text. So you say, so Dan just lied to us. He completely missed the boat. And he goes, no, 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 no. Dan said true things from the Bible, just not my main point of these two chapters in the text. This is a doctrinal sermon. It's biblical preaching. Um, And I'm convinced this is the right move for today. Not for every day, um, but I hope I have a message for us that will encourage our weary hearts. And honestly, I could skip this announcement if I was preaching anywhere else. Um, But you guys expect something from the Bible. You expect something from the pulpits. And I absolutely love that about us. Uh, So I I needed to give that disclaimer. So so that being said, we're going to be in Exodus 33 to speak on the nature and character of God. Exodus 33 and into 34 to speak on the nature and character of God. And I believe this is an important use of our time because things aren't always as they seem. Whether it's a plot twist in a TV show or a misperception that we've made, we often find out what we initially thought was true turns out not to be the full picture. And one of my great concerns as a pastor is that we get stuck believing the things that we assume about God, maybe our first introduction to him. And instead of reading the Bible clearly, deeply, regularly to find out who God is, who God says he is, we just take our assumptions and we run with them, what we've imagined, what we've grown up with. And the typical way that we're introduced to God is in an evangelistic conversation where we're introduced to a God who is angry at you, who is on the precipice of sending you to hell unless you believe the gospel. And I'm not denying that. It's an important part of the gospel truth. But maybe we don't want to just stick with our first impressions. Maybe we want a more well-rounded picture of God. Things aren't always as they seem. I mean, the movie that's on the TV most at my house because of my three-year-old daughter is Frozen, obviously. And it took my wife and I the longest time to convince her, it's nine years old, I don't have to say spoiler alert, that Hans is a bad guy and not actually a good guy. Because from the opening scenes of Frozen, you would think that Hans is, is a great guy. He and Anna are in love. They sing together, they dance together, they finish each other's sandwiches. And so my daughter's convinced that Hans is a goodie, not a baddie. But if you get to the end of the movie, you know the villain is actually Hans. Things aren't always as they seem. 
So given the way we're introduced to God, we see one aspect of his character, but if we read scripture, we let God introduce himself to us, and we get a fuller picture. He describes his character in his own words, and we might be amazed by the things that he says about himself. So um, let's look at Exodus 33 and 34, where we see God does just that. He opens up his heart to Moses, and he reveals the truest, the deepest, most fundamental things about who he is and how he relates to uh, his people. So Exodus 33, verse 18, if you're not already there, I want to show you this for yourselves. Because um, if we miss out on who God truly is, you miss out on the joy of knowing him, the joy of knowing his goodness and kindness and comfort. But not only that, I mean, knowing God truly will change the way we pray to him, the way we approach him, the way we trust him, the way you represent him to others and introduce them to him, maybe this week at VBS. If we get God wrong, I mean, what's even the point of worshiping here together if we're not worshiping God in spirit and in truth? Let me make this a Father's Day sermon, right? Dads, part of our role is to represent God as father to our children. So we need to know what kind of father it's, we're, we're tasked with representing. Not only that, parenting is hard. Man, I've had a hard day parenting already. And we need to know who's the God that we can go to for strength, for grace, for mercy in our time of need. In fact, I'm convinced that most, I'm tempted to say all here, but I'm going to leave it at most of the problems that we experience as Christians with God are because we're missing some level of understanding about who God truly is. So let's ask God, who are you? And let him answer. Exodus 33. It's towards the end of the book of Exodus. Uh, Egypt's al- or Israel's already been rescued out of the land of Egypt, out of their slavery. They've come to Mount Sinai. They're camped there. Moses went up the mountain. He got the Ten Commandments. He came down the mountain. He became the worst sinner of all time because he broke all t- Ten Commandments at the same time. Um, that was a joke. He broke the actual text. Never mind. Um, After the golden cow incident, Moses is pleading with God to continue with his people. And starting in verse 18, we see this prayer from Moses. Moses said, please show me your glory. And he, and God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Let me summarize the next section here. Um, In the beginning of chapter 34, God says to Moses, So in the morning, come up on the mountain, first thing, bring two new tablets. I'm going to give you the second printing of the Ten Commandments here. And Moses does exactly that. He cuts the tablets early in the morning. He goes up on the mountain, pick up in verse 5 of chapter 34. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. So from this text, I want to focus on just two main themes. 
God's glory from the end of 33, verses 18 through 23, and then God's name, that's 34, verses 5 through 8. So, so start with God's glory, right? That, that's Moses' prayer. God, show me your glory. And, and God replies to him, I'll cover you with my hand. I'll pass by you. You can see my back, but you can't see my face and live. It's so glorious that if you see it, you'll die. You'll explode because human beings aren't able to take in that level of glory that the creator has. But the prayer in itself is it's a wonderful prayer in 318. Show me your glory. I mean, haven't you ever wanted to be like Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6 or John in Revelation 1 where you see just the full unadulterated glory of God. I mean, I remember being a teenager, and I'd lay in bed and pray this prayer, right? God, show me your glory, because because I was a Christian, but my life seemed so, what, so normal, right? I'd gone to church my whole life. I knew the stories of how God used to act. I knew about the Red Sea and the floating axe and the walls of Jericho. I knew about the fire from heaven on Mount Carmel and the lion's den. I mean, goodness gracious, I was Noah in the church production of 100% chance of rain, thankfully long before YouTube existed. Um, But then I look at my life, and it's nothing special. Like, none of that stuff is happening for me. What, What did God have against me, right? Why was God absent from me? I wanted to know him. I wanted to please him. I wanted to serve him. I wanted to show up for him. So why wasn't he willing to show up for me? As I already mentioned, our first impression is usually that God doesn't care much for you, that God's angry, and he's perfectly content to send you off to hell for eternity. So why would we expect much from God? It it seems we operate with this picture of God like You know, like the sitcom dad, right? He's kind of, he he doesn't want to be bothered. He he doesn't want to talk to his kids. He doesn't want to interact with them. He doesn't want to play. He just wants to be left alone and watch TV or work in the garage or whatever it is the father does. Um, Thankfully, in the sitcoms, the kid can always pester him enough to get him to do what he wants, get a ride to the mall or his friend's house. Um, The dad doesn't do these things because he loves his kids, but just to get his kids off of his back. And so if we think that God is somehow grumpy, if he doesn't want to be bothered, that he wants nothing to do with us, that we're kind of a nuisance, then we praise Jesus because Jesus is the kid who can twist God's arm to get him to do what he wants him to to do, right? Jesus stands before a get-off-my-lawn kind of God to save us, to keep us from being destroyed, and now God has to love us. He doesn't want to, but he's obligated to, and a lot of us approach God like that, but as I said, things aren't always as they seem, because when Moses prays to God, show me your glory, look at verse 19. How does God answer? Moses says, show me your glory, and God says, okay, I'll make all my glory pass before you. No. What's it say? It says, I'll make my goodness pass before you. That's, that's interesting, because we expect if we want to see God's glory, we look at his powerful acts, his creation of everything out of nothing. When he stops the sun in the sky, when he rains fire from heaven, But God corrects our assumptions. He goes, no, 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 no. Those things do show my glory. But if you want the full picture of my glory, don't look at my power. Look at my goodness. Don't look at my actions. Look at my character. It's the goodness of God that most displays his glory. Um, Maybe I should define glory real quick. Glory is the display of God's godness, right? It's, It's the outworking of who he is. Uh, One author says, when we speak of God's glory, we're speaking of who God is, what he's like, his distinctive resplendence. That is what makes God, God. So God equates his goodness with his glory here in verse 19, and he says that my goodness will pass before you. And then without contradiction, in verse 22, he says, my glory is going to pass by. He uses these words interchangeably. So if we think seeing God's glory 
primarily means praying to see something new, like I did, something you haven't seen, power, miracles, greatness, then maybe we're mistaken in just living off these first impressions because God's glory is primarily seen in his goodness, in his character. And that's why I said I think most of our problems are because we misunderstand God. We miss out on the joy of knowing him, maybe thinking he's holding something out from us um, because we live off of, his, off of our assumption. But when we realize we actually get to experience his glory every time we experience his goodness towards us, I mean, that's something completely different. His goodness is the primary display of his glory. And he actually begins to explicate, to explain this goodness in the next section of God's name. He takes this idea of goodness and he, he explains to us what it actually entails. So when Moses comes up the next morning to the mountain, God proclaims his name. He says, the Lord, the Lord. And then he starts to explain his goodness. He reveals to Moses his glory. This is what we read in chapter 34. I'll, I'll read it again just to remind us, starting in verse 5. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed by him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. These words that, that God speaks to Moses, they're incredibly important. Um, they're quoted just in the Old Testament alone some 20-some 20 20 times um, because this is, this is the clearest place in the Old Testament where God pulls back the veil and shows us, this is who I am. This is my heart. This is my character. You don't have to try and figure me out. I will tell you exactly who I am. So let's take a minute and just consider the things that he says. He says, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious. Isn't that astounding? The first two words God uses to describe himself are merciful and gracious. It's not vengeful and demanding like we might expect. It's not almighty and authoritative. He says merciful and gracious. The way God chooses to show off his glory is by having mercy and being gracious. His glory is in his mercy and his grace. These are, these are similar terms, right? Mercy is not giving someone the, 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 the penalty, the, the punishment they deserve. Grace is giving somebody a blessing they don't deserve. And our God is both. Which means, as I read um, in an article from Ray Ortland this week, quote, you will never ask too much of God. You will never ask too often. He will never respond to you with an eye roll and say, really? You again? This is the 19th time just today that you've come back to me asking for more strength. What's your problem? No, that's what we're like. Let's never project onto him our own pettiness. He has fullness of grace for you moment by moment. Go to him. Go back to him. Never stop going back to him. He is always happy to welcome you and help you. The real you. The first words God speaks about his character are grace and mercy. Is that what we believe about God? Is that how we represent him? But it's not just grace and mercy. He continues on to say he's slow to anger, which that's not us either, right? One thing goes wrong, and we're quick to the trigger. We, we don't get what we want, and we're angry about it. We're quick-tempered, short fuses, spiteful. We're easily provoked to frustration. But God's not that way. God's easily provoked to mercy, but it takes a lot to make him angry. I mean... Have you just looked at the world recently 
Have you looked around and seen everything that's going on? And you have to wonder, why doesn't God just, you know, send back Jesus on a white horse and just end it? Burn it all, shut it down, let's be done with this wickedness. Because first Pe- or Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, it's because God is slow to anger. The Lord's not slow to fulfill his promises, as some count slowness, but he's patient towards you. He's not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God's quick to be merciful and gracious. He's slow to anger. And at the end of verse 6, we see he's abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands of generations. Right? God's stingy with anger, generous with grace and mercy, and here we see he overflows with steadfast love and faithfulness. His love endures for thousands of generations, not Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but down to his great, 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 a thousand plus great grandkids. In other words, his love never ends. It's a river that flows forever. God doesn't look at a sin and be like, you know what? I'm done. I'm done with this whole salvation thing. Like, it was a good run, but I'm, I'm giving up. You people are way too awful for me to deal with. No, his love is steadfast. It never changes. It never ends. It's consistent, permanent, eternal for thousands upon thousands of generations. Generations not of perfect people, of sinners, I might add. But look at the way that this love and mercy and steadfast faithfulness come to sinners. It comes by forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. I think those three words all come together just to to kind of paint this whole gamut, this picture of disobedience and rebellion against God. It shows us there's nothing out there that God will not forgive. None of us have run too far to outrun God's forgiveness. Um, Richard Sibbs, a Puritan, he famously wrote, there's more mercy in Christ than there's sin in us. And here we see the same is true about the Father. You and I are sinners. We've seen our lives. We don't need to be convinced of this. We deserve justice. We deserve death for our sin. That's, that's been the punishment since the garden. It's, it's not a surprise for us. We deserve God's wrath, not his love. None of us deserve his kindness. But God, to show off his glory, to show off his goodness, he actually forgives our iniquity, our transgression, our sins. And instead, he lavishes on us his love. God glorifies himself through forgiveness. It shows how truly magnificent he is. But don't hear what I'm not saying. Don't think that God doesn't care about sin, you know, just because he forgives it. He makes sure that we don't make the wrong assumption here. Look at that last phrase. But who who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation? God ensures that we know that he does take sin seriously. He does judge it. God doesn't just clear the guilty willy-nilly. Oh, don't worry about sin. It's not a big deal. No, he holds you accountable. He holds you accountable to your sin. But if you humble yourself and repent and turn to him, then he delights to show forgiveness. It's, It's a tension of salvation, isn't it? It's the tension of God's character and of God's glory. We see God's glory shown in his forgiveness of sin, and we also see his glory in upholding justice for sin. God's goodness can't tolerate our evil. He takes it seriously and punishes it, and that is for the display of his glory, and yet he also delights to forgive it maybe a a tension that's difficult for us to hold in our minds. Maybe it was difficult for Moses to understand it as well. But after hearing this explanation of God's goodness, what's Moses' response? Look at verse 8 here. He quickly bows down and he worships God. What other response is there? That's the only response to seeing God in truth. Bowing down and worship. 
So let me recap where we've been, right? Moses prays to have this exclusive look at God's glory. He's seen God's glory and, you know, the burning bush and the pillar of cloud and fire and the parting of the Red Sea uh, in the mountain with a storm and thunder and lightning. And yet he prays, show me your glory. And God says, my glory is so great that if you look on it, you will die, but I will show you my back, whatever that means. Um, and in this special revelation of the goodness of God, his glory, God describes what makes him glorious, that he is holy and set apart and better than everything else in creation combined because of his love, his mercy, his compassion, his faithfulness, his forgiveness, and his justice. And so maybe by this time you're wondering, so what does this have to do with me? What, what's this matter about God's character? Because remember, I said we often think of God based on our assumptions rather than the truth that God provides for us. And therefore, things aren't always as they seem. I mean, it is so hard for us to believe what God says about himself. It's hard to believe that God actually loves us. We constantly go back to thinking that God is vindictive and petty and wants nothing to do with his people. That we're sinners and he's holy and therefore God wants nothing to do with us. Where when we read the Bible, the logic is we're sinners and he's holy and therefore God God, in his great mercy, brings us back to him. That he wants to be with us to the point that he slaughters his own son so that we may be forgiven and spend eternity with God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Not because we're great and worthy, but because he is. And he shows his greatness in compassion and mercy and forgiveness towards us. He glorifies himself in his character in this way. I mean, goodness gracious, so much of our stress and our angst is because we refuse to believe God when he tells us exactly who he is and what he's like. If we actually believed what we, we were told, our lives would be so much better. We could stop living our lives like God is, like he's trying to send us to hell on a technicality. I mean, there's there's a lot of things that are different there's a lot of things that are difficult about being a Christian, but at least for me, one of the most difficult things I've been called to is to simply trust and believe the gospel. Right? Maybe I'm alone here. I, I doubt it. It seems like every day I wake up and I struggle to remember that since God is for me, who can be against me? That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that anyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. That, you know, while I was still a sinner, Christ died for me. And that his steadfast love is so strong and so sure that neither tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger of the sword can separate me from that love. I revert back to my assumptions. I project my own sinful character onto the Father, and I interpret his character in light of my circumstances instead of interpreting my circumstances in light of his character. One of the most difficult parts of worshiping God is simply believing who he is. It's, it's not believing who God tells us he is. Well, actually, God doesn't just tell us who he is. He also shows us in ways that are far better than we could imagine, in ways that aren't always as it seems. I mean, think about this for a second. You're Moses, right? This had to be a mountaintop experience for you, pun intended. Um, seeing God's glory, right? Even though he can't see God's face, he got to hear the voice of God. He got to see the back of God. God says, sure, you can't see my face and live, but Exodus 34 is an amazing point in Moses' life. But God actually answers this prayer again for Moses. Um, flip over to Luke 9, if you will. Luke 9, verse 28. And I want to show you just this one thing, and then we're done. Luke 9, 
Luke 9, verse 28, it's a scene we're familiar with. It reads, Now about eight days after saying, after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. 29. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. And he was saying these things. A cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. So at this point, Moses has been dead for thousands of years. And one day, I I have no idea how this happened. Moses is just living his afterlife. He's, you know, kicked back watching the game with Noah and Enoch. He gets up to grab some guacamole from the fridge and whoosh! He's taken out of his heavenly apartment and he's thrown onto the Mount of Transfiguration. And this time, on this mountain, he stares dead into the eyes of the glory of God. On Mount Sinai, he only got to see God's back, but here on this mountain, he gets to see the full glory of God. He looks full into the face of God the Son with his glory on display, because Hebrews 1, 3 tells us that Jesus Christ is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. On this mountain, the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses' prayer is answered again in an even better way. He saw God's nature. He sees Jesus Christ, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiven and just. What he had heard on Mount Sinai in 2D, he now sees standing before him in three dimensions, face to face. And verse 31 says they talked about Jesus' departure at Jerusalem. That is Jesus' death on the cross. And so that tension that we held on to of how can God both be just, not just sweeping sin under the rug, and merciful, forgiving sinners for their sin, it's resolved. It's resolved as they discuss that Jesus will die outside of Jerusalem to pay the penalty for our sin so that God can forgive us while remaining true to his own righteousness, while he still takes sin seriously. And on that cross, we see the extent of God's steadfast, faithful love. That's not just talk on the mountain. It is love in action as Jesus Christ gives his life so that sinners like you and me may be forgiven. Moses thought that he had seen the fullness of God's glory in Exodus, but things aren't always as they seem. Now he sees God's full glory in the face of Jesus Christ. And we too, as we look at the glory of God displayed in his Son, we see God for who he truly is a God who is merciful and compassionate, willing to forgive at the cost of Christ's life. This is the glory of the God we worship, a glory seen in compassionate goodness. And I pray that as we move from our our assumptions about God to the truth from Scripture, that we might experience all the joy and the comfort of experiencing him and knowing him truly and fully. So take a moment and pray, and then I'll close us and pray to that end.